The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. On this Labor Day Monday, we revisit two conversations celebrating another kind of solidarity, friendship. First, writer Rona Maynard and her four-legged best friend are with us on how dogs can make us better humans. Then, Jay and Jagannathan finds out why it can be so hard for adults to find social connection and make new pals and what to do about it. It's Monday, September 4th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. It's fair to say that just about everyone encountered the unexpected in one way or another over the past few years, but this isn't exactly a pandemic story. Rona Maynard, formerly editor-in-chief of Chatelaine, among other accomplishments, didn't want or see the point of having a dog until one arrived to change her life. Her new memoir tells that story. It's called Starter Dog, My Path to Joy, Belonging, and Loving This World. And here's Rona Maynard, Hi. Hi. And here's your friend <laughs> to tell us more. Well, why don't we say you do the talking here and, and Casey will just do the, um, the looking sharp. Is that all right? Excellent. Okay. Would you care to give the full introduction to your friend here? This is Casey Charles Jones, my very first dog. Jones is my husband's surname and it was his idea that we should have a dog. And the dog is how old? He's almost 10, but nobody can believe it because he's bouncing all over the place. Yeah, he's very energetic, although right now, very calm and cool, and we like that. I don't know what you did yeah. to bring this out in him. It's a gift. What can I tell you? You, you had your first dog literally just 10 years ago. Uh, well, he wasn't, he wasn't a puppy when we got him. So, uh, no, it was eight years ago. Eight years ago, okay. We could not have a puppy because we live in an eighth floor condo. So uh, the puppy training was impossible. We decided we wanted a young adult dog. And you got one. A rescue. And this dog is uh, this dog is from a long way away, actually. How did he end up coming to you? Well, it's quite a story. He was born unwanted in Ohio in Belmont County, taken to the local shelter. And from there, he went to a prison, a men's prison. They had one of these programs that pair prisoners and dogs. The unwanted humans train the unwanted pups to be adoptable. Hmm. And then the theory is they go back to the shelter and they find homes. Now, whoever trained him was kind of loosey-goosey. He's not the best trained dog in terms of sitting and lying down and forget about shaking paws, but he learned very early how to love and how to trust. He's very, you know what? He, he definitely did that. I've just met this dog, obviously, and we went for a, a brief little walk. He Licking loves... my hands. Yeah, he's just jumping up and just sort of very, very friendly with me. He's always in a mood to make a friend. Now, we were told a real line about this dog. We were told the shelter was a high kill shelter, and we were told that he was a lab pug mix and great with kids. And I thought, oh, isn't this wonderful? Because I thought he was going to love our grandson. Hmm. Well, he didn't love our grandson. They did not get along. Hmm. He's not a lab pug mix. No, it doesn't look it. We had his DNA done, we know. And the shelter is a no-kill shelter. Ah. So they just basically said all this in hopes that you'd take the dog. Yes, and they, they said whatever they had to say. And the one thing they said that was true was the most important thing. They said, he's the perfect dog for you. Now, they didn't know that. They were just stringing you along, right? They're handing you a line. Well, But it they turns out to be true. They weren't, they weren't. Uh, they knew we were older. They knew we had never had a dog before. So they weren't going to give us a dog with behavior issues. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to give us a traumatized dog. And a lot of those come into care. They weren't going to give us a dog with complicated medical problems. How did the notion of having a dog in the first place at this stage of your life sit with you? 
I had extremely mixed feelings about it. In <laughs> fact, when my husband said, let's get a dog, my first reaction was, you've got to be kidding. We've missed the moment for a dog. I thought the time for a dog was when you have kids. Yeah, well, it's the best time, but well, not the only time. Uh, I would dispute that, actually. Uh, I think now is, is actually the best time. How come? What do I know, really? Because we didn't have a dog when we were young. But what I love about having a dog now is that we can really relax and slow down and enjoy him mm. and take in all the little details of how he is changing and enriching and expanding our life together and our life in the community. When we were working, we were working really hard. We were very preoccupied mm. with our jobs. No time for a dog then, in some respects. Um, really, no. Every so often, one of us would say, wouldn't it be nice to have a dog? And uh, then we'd say, well, we couldn't possibly have a dog. And when I was editing Chatelaine, my busiest years ever, I briefly conceived this notion that a dog would get me out of the office earlier and get me home to do something that was good for me, go out and take a walk. I thought a dog was like a glorified stairmaster. <laughs> and I somehow thought Christmas was coming, that my husband was getting me a dog. Because he said, don't go in the garage. You have to stay out of the garage. Mm. I thought, there's a dog in there. Silly me. It had not occurred to me, because I knew so little about dogs. When is this dog walking? Why is this dog not barking? What kind of life can a dog have shut up in a garage? Mm -hmm. Anybody who could think that a dog could be kept for two weeks in a garage is not ready to have a dog. <laughs> so it was a very good thing that there was no dog in the garage. What it actually was was a neon sign with my name on it. What about cats? Did you have cats growing oh, up? We had quite a few. Okay. And my husband and I had cats as well. So you're clearly a cat person then? Well, I thought I was. Until this one came along. Yeah, I thought cats are easy. Well, they are easier. I, Lower maintenance, anyway. I, I thought cats, they'll find a sunny corner. Uh, they will bask. They will look good on your couch. They'll come and rug, rub against your legs. And they'll be home by themselves, and they won't miss you. Now, I know there are people who would disagree with that and say, yes, they do miss you. Hmm. But uh, all our cats seemed... Uh, mostly indifferent to our presence. Uh, they're just giving off that vibe so you don't get cocky. They do they're, miss you. Our best cat was named Casey, and he was the same color as this, jo as this dog, ah. and we named our dog for the cat. Gotcha. This is, I mean, you've written this story, Starter Dog, and it really is, it's a lovely story about how th the aforementioned has changed your life. And I want to read a little excerpt from this, shall we? Yes. Sheldon, bring this up if you would. You write, with Casey, I didn't analyze. I simply felt like blowing imaginary bubbles while screaming, yes, let's. It was a whole new way to be. Or should I say, a new way to be whole. Casey reached out to me with paws and nose and tongue. He pulled me into a realm of undiluted feeling. For the first time, I didn't much care what I thought or knew. Some things about being human can't be learned from your own kind. Fascinating. So this is dog as therapist, dog as spiritual leader. How did this happen? I was ready. I think it really is true that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I had tried so many things to enlarge my life. I was frustrated. I was at loose ends. I had uh, been away from the corporate world for a long time, thought I needed a big project to uh, wrap my busy brain around. You needed a new mission in life. And, and I thought it was going to have complicated moving parts. Mm. 
that would be solved with brain power and maybe a smart human colleague or two. I had tried all kinds of work on myself. I'd done the 12-step group. I'd done therapy, marriage counseling, various kinds of body work, hung upside down from ropes in a yoga <laughs> class. Uh, and there were all these smart people, caring people, who had tried to help me lead a better life. And in their separate ways, they had all made contributions. But what I had never learned to do was nothing. That's a hard thing for, for very, you know, active A-type personality, yes. mission-driven people to it do. Is, it is hard to let go of the expectation that you must have something to show for your day. Yes. And so, enter Casey, and this is your new mission in life. He got me out meeting my neighbors. I had always just barreled past them. I lived downtown in a neighborhood where every day we might meet tourists from New York and Italy, and we also meet people on their lunch hour and a juggler practicing his moves and a bunch of homeless people. Hmm. And to Casey, they are all equal. They are all the same. And they are all interesting, if they are interested in him. It's a great, it, it's a great thing that a dog, in some respects, teaches us so much about people, right? Yes. And when I think about achievement and my attitude to achievement, I think particularly about one man in our neighborhood. He was a middle-aged black man in a wheelchair with uh, very long fingers. I, I always thought piano fingers. And he rode around all day in the neighborhood giving treats to dogs. He couldn't have a dog himself, but he loved dogs. And I thought of him as a dispenser of happiness. Hmm. I don't know if he worked for a living. I do not know what he had done with his life before he was in a wheelchair. But I can tell you he made a profound impact on my day every time I saw him. He disappeared. Uh, we used to see him, watch for him. He loved Casey, and Casey loved him. And he'd been gone for months, and I thought, where is JP? So I logged into the neighborhood Facebook group, and I asked if anyone had seen him, where is JP? And somebody said, I think he had a stroke. And then a day went by and somebody else said that he had died. Hmm. And my heart broke. I felt my eyes well with tears that JP was gone. And, and all these other people came and said, echoing me, how much they missed him, how much he brought to the neighborhood just by being a kind person that people looked forward to seeing every day, I still think of him. And that's a man you may never have met if not for Casey. I would never have met him. Huh. I would have walked past him because he was in a black wheelchair and he always wore black from head to toe. I probably would not even have noticed him. Hmm. Do you and your husband, Paul, compete for Casey's attention? No, and uh, if I ever tried to compete, it would be game over because Paul is Casey's favorite. Why? Well, lots of reasons. Paul is very expansive and he makes noises and he plays silly games. Uh, he's really out there with a the dog. He's a big burly guy and the guys in prison, I think, were big burly guys. So I imagine that he probably channels Casey's first friends in the world. Casey doesn't like kids very much, and I think it's because there were no kids in prison. Oh, uh, okay. So he has really no history of having to learn how to deal with children. That's right. 
Uh, the other reason Casey uh, prefers Paul is that Paul has a much freer hand with the treats and with the food on his plate. Should I risk one now? Yeah. Can why I, don't you? Why can don't I give you, Casey a treat? Oh yeah. All right. Why don't you give him a treat? It's funny. Although it might get him rather excited, and he's nice and calm. Well, he's been so nice and calm now. I feel we should reward him. Hey, look at this. Hey, Casey. Yeah, I know. You can smell this, right? Can I give you that? There you go, sweetheart. Okay, that's great. You okay with that? <laughs> now, how many? How many do you give at one time? Well, you see, I would only give him one. But my husband uh, probably would give more than that. Would give more than one? Well. I'm the keeper of the toothbrush. <laughs> that is not nearly as much fun for a dog. I'm going to give you another one, OK? Is that all right? And then maybe mm. you'll like me more than you like Rona. Is uh, that possible? You're working on it. I'm working on it. You've got, uh, you've got a real shot. How old's the grandson? He is now 13. But when we got him, he was... Uh, Little, he was, um, I think he was nine. He's an only child, quite shy, and he was afraid of Casey. Hmm. Has that changed? It, it, it has changed. He's not afraid anymore. He now will pet Casey, but for the longest time he was scared and he thought Casey would bite him. And dogs pick up on this kind of thing. If they know that you're scared, of them, then they're going to be kind of scared yeah, of Yeah, they sense it. Can I assume that when you were running Chatelaine, if you had seen somebody walking their do dog along the street, you would have thought, there's somebody with their dumb animal? Well, kind of. <laughs> uh, I never understood why people were so broken up when their dogs died. I hate to say that, but it is true. I once worked in an office uh, at McLean's where a woman took time off work because her dog had died. Mm -hmm. And the guys in the office said terrible things about her and how she wasn't really serious. And I thought, she's let the side down. Hmm. It is up to her to be a strong feminist and uh, care about the work above everything else. And this dog is just a dog. Was I ever wrong? For so many people, the dog is the most important relationship in their life. And yet, here was I saying, well, your dog never helped you figure out how to deal with your boss. Your dog never baked you a cake on your birthday. And that's not what it's about at all. What's it about? Your dog relates to you feeling to feeling and moment to moment. Mm -hmm. It is a realm of pure emotion that you share together. And with a human family member or friend, a lot of stuff gets into the mix. Mm -hmm. This is unconditional love here, right? Your dog, Casey, gives you unconditional love. But he, more important than that to me, and by the way, he's giving you unconditional <laughs> love too. It's wonderful. Is that I give him mm -hmm. so much love, and the love that I give him spills over into all these other relationships mm -hmm. with the world and with the people that I meet and with the creatures of the earth. I was never particularly interested in nature or animals mm. until I walked a dog. And he cracked that world open to me. I will now stop to have a conversation with a frog. Would that have happened <laughs> before Casey? No. <laughs> Casey has no interest in frogs, by the way. Where do you stand on the issue, and you and I have both seen this, where people refer to their pets almost as if they were talking about their children? And certainly when a pet dies, it's as if you lose a member of the family. I won't say it's like losing a child, but it's like losing a member of the family. How, where do you come down on this issue of, of the anthropomorphization of pets? I never call myself his mom. Casey's mom, and I say this with the utmost affection for her, is a bitch in Ohio. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a very funny line, I know. That's and good. I'm so grateful to that dog. <laughs> I have a son. I am his mother. That is a very different kind of relationship. And yet my love for Casey is boundless. It is a different kind of love. And I never think about Casey, oh, he shouldn't be doing that. He should be doing it the way I would do it. I do, I'm afraid, have those thoughts sometimes about mm -hmm. my son, as my mother had those thoughts about me. So it's all okay. Yeah, it's all okay. Yeah. You know, we, we reserve the right with our human children to pass a certain amount of quiet judgment uh, on their lives. <laughs> This is not necessarily known as one of the smartest breeds of dog. Definitely. Are you okay with that? Made your peace with that? I absolutely have, although I've got to tell you, Steve, when we went looking for a dog, we thought we wanted a smart dog because we were smart people. <laughs> and uh, we wanted him to carry the family honor. But... I don't think he is very smart. Uh, he has a tiny vocabulary of known words, as far as we can tell. He is the world's ranking expert on us. Mm -hmm. So you certainly could argue he knows everything that he needs to know. And we had a blast going to the dog lab at U of T back when they had one. The lab has uh, now moved to Brown University, but they were doing experiments on how dogs think. And I, I took Casey there uh, twice, and uh, I said, does everybody come here secretly thinking, how smart is my dog? <laughs> and they said, yes, because <laughs> we all do well, maybe not all of us, some of us are more pure, but lots of us do want to think our dog is really smart. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. The dog just needs to know enough to get th through his day and love it. And Casey knows, he's been in many hotels, he knows what a hotel is and how it's set up and how life is in a hotel. And he knows that uh, when Whitney arrives at the door, he's going to the doggy farm for his vacation. <laughs> and he knows that when he hears a banana being peeled from two rooms away, and he hears my husband's footsteps, he's getting a chunk of banana. <laughs> yeah, that's how he knows. Let me ask you one last thing, and that is, I mean, at, at some point, point you're going to have to imagine your life without this dog that is inevitable can you imagine i mean can you can you really get your head around what your life would have been like had you never met i can't because i look at how my life has blossomed in the past eight years and it would not have happened without casey I would be totally in my head, the same way I was uh, until age 65. And when we lose him, as we will, I will certainly want another dog. I won't be able to imagine life without a dog. I will miss him terribly. And I do think about that, but Every moment that we've had together is indelible in a way because I carry these memories and they're part of my walk and my senses and how I see the world. He's, he's always going to be with me. I know, I can tell. Starter Dog is the name of your book and your dog has been just so superb during our time together here. Can I give him one more treat? Oh, I think he'll let you. One more treat. Hey, Casey. <laughs> Let's do one more treat, just because you were so good. You were so good. You didn't make any interruptions at all. You didn't good bark, boy, you didn't do Casey. anything. Good job, Casey. 
You're terrific. You're shedding like hell all over our seat, but you're <laughs> terrific. We need to use the Furminator. Yeah, I think that's right. Rona, thank you so much for coming thank in Thank you. It was fun. People talk pretty freely about how tough it can be to find the right romantic partner. What's much less common, maybe even taboo, is talking about finding new friends. But those platonic relationships can be just as important to life and sometimes even longer lasting. So we're going to talk about why it can be hard for adults to make friends. With Julie Erickson, clinical psychologist at Forest Hill Center for CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, Chloe Bow, founder of Toronto Girl Social, David Lewis Pert, therapist in training at Talk It Out Counseling Clinic, and David McKinn, columnist at the Globe and Mail. Welcome to you all. Thank you for making it in. I know it was a bit of a, a commute for all of you, but I really appreciate you guys for making the studio today. Uh, Julie, I'm going to come to you. Sure. How do friendships, or the lack thereof, mm -hmm. affect our physical and mental well-being? There's certainly a really large body of literature suggesting that the lack of social connection or social support is implicated in a wide variety of different mental disorders. There's even a, a research study that was published not too long ago implicating uh, chronic loneliness uh, as being equivalent to about smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of your risk of mortality. So it's very real in terms of the impact of uh, friendships and social support, but also the absence of that connection and support um, can really come at a detriment to people. All right. Uh, now, a number of you have sort of have networks and have talked about loneliness and, and friendships and the importance. Chloe, I'm going to come to you. You founded Toronto Girl Social, an inclusive network created for women to meet up and have fun. What made you come up with this idea? Yeah, um, it was at a time in my life where I was starting completely fresh. So I had actually left a long term relationship and moved out on my own for the very first time. And my life was totally changing. I, I'm naturally an extroverted person, so I started vlogging about my experience online, being single in Toronto and making new friends. And I think a lot of people don't talk about friend breakups that can happen when you leave a relationship. And I um, was in the market for some new friends. So I was reaching out to a lot of people um, that I met through TikTok and through Instagram. And I had uh, some girls over one night okay. who, from all different walks of life, um, different backgrounds, different lived experiences. And I was having so much fun. We had the best time. And I was like, how do I bottle this feeling? And um, create it for other people. And at the same time, I was building this community online, talking about my experience, talking about my breakup, and the courage it can take to leave a long-term relationship. And that was really resonating with a lot of people and a lot of women. And I kept getting asked, you know, how do you know it's time to break up? Or even, how do you make friends? I'm worried I'm gonna be alone. I'm worried I'm gonna be lonely. And so with that knowledge that people are looking for friendships, and with the experience that I had having so much fun making new friends, I was like, in my head, I just kind of came up with this idea. I'm like, I'm going to start an inclusive social club for women where the goal is just to have fun and make connections and make new friends and have cool experiences. And so I put it out there. I just said it online. I said it on TikTok. And then people were like, I'm in. I want to join. Sign me up. And now we're hosting events every month. And what does an event look like? Oh my gosh, we have really cool events, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, we started off with a puppy yoga class, oh. and um, that was our first event, which was amazing because uh, puppies just break the ice so easily. Um, a lot of people come to our events and can be a little bit nervous or shy at first, but after you know a few a, a few hours, like it, it's so relaxing and it's so fun. Um, actually, we we get a lot of attention from some really cool brands like movie companies, which was oh. cool. So through um, social media, we've had the opportunity to um, partner with Warner Brothers and we got invited to the Elvis movie premiere. We got to meet oh, wow. the cast of Elvis, which was really cool. We got to go to a TIFF party. Um, can so I join this? <laughs> <laughs> we can make an exception okay. for you. All right, all right. Yeah. Sounds, sounds yeah. really cool. All right, uh, Dave, I'm going to come to you. Uh, you got personal. You wrote uh, a first person essay for the Globe and Mail. This is pre pandemic. Yes. Um, exploring why men have have such a difficult time maintaining friendships. Did you find the answers? I think I got close to some of the answers. Um, yes, yeah, so in 2019, same thing, long-term relationship uh, ended. My marriage of 15 years ended. 
And I realized that I didn't, I mean, I, I had close friends, but I hadn't been maintaining my close friends. And, and it really struck me at the time just how important it is to have friends and how many guys, I think, in their 40s are really bad at maintaining their friendships. And so, you know, I talked to experts like you and, and you know, clinical psychologists and researchers. And, you know, there's a lot of different answers, but what seems to be the common core of it is that guys have a really difficult time being vulnerable with one another. <laughs> Right, it's. I think it's difficult for a lot of guys to see someone they maybe connect with or want to hang out with to say like, "Hey, do you want to hang out with me?" There's a certain codes of masculinity I think that really prevent guys from making that step, and it's a real shame because, as we all know, friendship has huge amount of benefits for our well-being, for our physical health, for our mental health. Um, and so that, that was basically the gist of it is the conclusion was, you know, maybe just try to be a little bit more open with, with right. approaching people. We'll definitely touch on, we'll come back to the masculinity part because that I think is a, a big conversation as well. David, you've been working with the Black Daddies Club and a recent initiative called Sunday Dinner. Tell us about right. those two. Yeah, Sunday Dinners is an initiative uh, that was started through Black Daddies Club founded by Brandon Hay. It's an opportunity to bring black men of all types together over a meal and a conversation. Um, and so he began that during the pandemic um, online and it turned out a number of, of folks. All right, a, a lot of this conversation about loneliness has been sort of, uh, has, has existed of course before the pandemic, but the pandemic has obviously exacerbated that. I want to read a, a recent BBC article published earlier this month that talks about how the COVID-19 pandemic has drastically changed the way we socialize, uh, especially for people who are in their early careers. Uh, so it reads, while work has traditionally been a place to make connections, many of these young people have lacked opportunities as firms shift to hybrid, distributed, or remote working models. Social circles have shrunk after a lonely couple of years during the pandemic, and in some cases, were never established at all. This means some young people are seeking new ways of making friends. Chloe, I'm coming to you. Through your personal experiences, but also through Toronto Girl Social, what are your thoughts on that take? And I'm sure there's plenty of conversation about a lot of people who are struggling to make those connections, whether it's in, in the corporate office setting or just starting their careers. Yeah, I think um, work from home life and the pandemic kind of ripped away a lot of social opportunities for people. And what I found in just connecting with my community with Toronto Girl Social members is there are not any um, like natural or organic opportunities to meet people and to make new friends. Um, so that's what I wanted to create because, you know, you, it's easy to say like, oh, you might meet someone at a gym class or, um, you know, where else would you really meet anybody these days? Like, no one meeting at the bar anymore. No. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe if you know if you're lucky or if you like the bar scene, but maybe you don't like that. And you know, if you're not in a community already, for example, maybe you're not into sports, you're not on a sports team, or you've graduated from school, and you know now you're not around people of the same age or the same uh, just sort of like experience or background or interests. Then it can be really difficult to kind of meet people. There isn't a lot of opportunity. All right, Julie, I'm going to get your take on, on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, two of the biggest predictors of friendship formation are proximity and similarity, right? Mm -hmm. So, Chloe's speaking to those things. So, we have less of the opportunity for, you know, um, water cooler talk, mm -hmm. right? And, and seeing the same people in the office or in the cubicle next door to you, that's going to make it challenging to, like, form and maintain friendships and to establish whether or not you're similar, whether you like each other, whether or not you have a similar sense of humor. It's hard to do that over Zoom meetings at mm -hmm. work. So, yeah, it puts everything everybody at a disadvantage. Now, a lot of the work that you do is with actually older adults mm -hmm. uh, in your practice. Are people more vulnerable to loneliness as they age? Well, they certainly have a number of different factors that both change how they socialize and the opportunities that they have to socialize. So older adults can experience things like changes in mobility or uh, physical health problems or even caregiving responsibilities to a spouse or to grandkids um, or even things like becoming a, a widow or a widower. All of these things can throw a wrench into um, opportunities that you have to socialize and really change how you're doing that with other people. Um, and it's especially problematic for older adults given that we we know that 
social isolation is actually uh, associated with increased risk of cognitive decline. Um, so this population um, is especially vulnerable to the effects of loneliness. All right, David, I want to talk about sort of the intersectionality, uh, black men specifically. Mm. What are some of the challenges black men, by black, faced by black men rather, when it comes to building adult friendships? Well, I don't think it's that dissimilar from the things that you spoke about, Dave. I think black mm. men are men. And, and we face the, all the same challenges that every other uh, ethno-racial group would experience. I think in some instances, there is the compounding of things. So um, not only dealing with the isolation as it relates to being vulnerable with other men and, and expressing your needs, but expectations that people put on you from outside, and that can be within the group or external to the group, I think take a toll on a lot of black men. I think also we're in a period where there's a lot of shifting um, dynamics around roles mm -hmm. and uh, the roles for men in society. And that's uh, landing on the shoulders of, of a lot of men, but more importantly, it's landing on the shoulders of a lot of racialized men who are, are dealing with that in addition to some other things like race, racism, and economic challenges and, and all these other sort of uh, pieces and components. All right. Dave, uh, you had mentioned uh, this in terms of your separation uh, with your partner. You both saw friend you, you saw friendship in a, in a new light uh, after that. Do we tend to prioritize romantic relationships over platonic ones? And what does that look like? I think when you're married and you have kids, you don't really have a huge amount of free time, right? I think this is one of the big components of making friends is how much time you have to spend with them. And when you're married with kids, you just don't have as much time as you might have otherwise. And on top of that, I think a lot of men make their wives their best friend. Right? So they go to their wives with their emotional problems or their joys or their successes, but they primarily see their wife as their best friend. And I think the problem with that is one, I don't, I'm not sure if it's fair to women to make them shoulder all that emotional work. <laughs> I'm sure they're happy about it most of the time. But then when it comes to time where you need your friends, you know, if you are separated or maybe you're just fighting with your wife or your wife says, go out. I'm sick of you, go see someone else. That's when you may realize you, you haven't put the time in with your friends and, and the consequences of that. I think it was in, your, in the research that you did, there's a number of hours that's sort of associated with what a close friend is, what yes. a, you know, just sort of an associate is. Yes. Tell me a little yes. bit about that. So there was a researcher, I believe he was at Indiana State University, who tracked how much time it takes to sort of go through a scale of friendship, right? Casual acquaintance to really good friend. And I think even for a sort of casual friend, it was something like just over 60 hours. But to become really close friends with someone, it was 200 hours. That's some time. That's some time, time, right? Yeah. And so I think the way I broke it down in the article was like, let's assume you and me hang out three hours at a time, right? That's, that's almost 70 hangouts right. for us to become really good friends. A lot of guys just don't have time for 70 hangouts, right? Like, it, 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 it requires a lot of investment in time, amongst other things, to be really close friends. And if you're not putting that time into it, then therefore you're just not going to become close friends with people. All right. David, I'm coming to you. Which one is more challenging, making new friends or maintaining and keeping old friends? I love that you saved that one. <laughs> Make it as difficult as possible. Um, I think that it's, it's likely making new friends. You spoke earlier about um, the ways in which we build relationships, proximity and similarity. Most of our significant relationships began in school or in our uh, home neighborhoods where we had to be in relation with, with one another. And so um, I think for a lot of folks, especially older folks, people um, after their teens struggle because there's not, as you said, a lot of opportunity to create that, that proximity. Yeah. And so I, I think that the challenge for a lot of, of, of adults is making new friends. Um, I think that there are challenges, of course, with maintaining friendships, but once you have that core group, you know, um, I think you're okay. Unfortunately, because of the way things are, are sort of rolling out, especially for younger people, there's not the opportunity for proximity. A lot of, of young people um, struggle with their relationships. Yeah. 
In fact, oftentimes, many young people are, have most of their relationships are parasocial. Things that are online, people that they actually don't know all that well. Right. I might know what you ate for breakfast, but I actually don't know you. And so I think that contributes to some of what we've talked about in terms of this sort of epidemic of loneliness that's impacting all generations of, of people, um, despite technology seemingly connecting yeah. us, you know? Yeah. And do you find with, with like you and your guy friends, when it comes to making new friends, do you find you and your guy friends are like, I'm good, man, I have my friends. I've known these guys since high school. I don't need new friends. And so I feel like if you have a core group of buddies, you're pretty good. But if you're someone who's like new to the city or trying to make friends, it's so hard to crack into that inner circle. Because I feel like men in particular, like I have my two best friends. Mm -hmm. I'm all right. Now you grew up in Oakville, correct? I grew up in Oakville. To live yeah. in Toronto. I live in Toronto, So a yes. bit of a, was that a bit of a, a struggle there? Uh, no, it was actually pretty good. I mean, you know, I moved here when I was 25 after going to university, and universities and I sort of kick you out of the nest, right? You have to make new friends. You can't just hang out with the friends in your hometown because you're not in your hometown anymore. And, and Oakville's close enough to Toronto that if any moments of loneliness or need, I could easily travel back there. Um, but I feel like in your 20s, I think part of why you make so many friends in your 20s is because you're really open to experience in your 20s. Like one, you have time, but you're also just open to doing things. And so, you know, you're starting a new job pre-pandemic, right? I, the problems that you talked about did not apply to me at that time. And so you're doing new things, you're starting new careers, you're pursuing new hobbies. And so it was, it was relatively easy, or much easier, I'll say, to make friends in my 20s. Um, but that said, you know, who are my 10 best friends? None of them are guys that I've known since grade seven, who I grew up with in Oakville. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. You have ten best friends. Well, <laughs> I, I have I, I have a lot of I have ten really close friends. Let's say that's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but we're all, you know, we've all known each other since grade seven, grade eight. Yeah. I think also the challenge with you know making friends in adulthood is there's an element of sort of social risk taking that's involved, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. like you need a willingness to step outside your comfort zone, which can be harder to do as people get older and we get used to who we know and what we know. Right. Um, and especially as people get older, like in the later stages of life, we know there are some motivational changes that happen uh, with time perspective changes. So as people perceive there's less time remaining in life, they start to focus in on the people that they know, the things that they know and enjoy as opposed to branching out and trying a bunch of new things and meeting new people. Yeah. Chloe, sure. I'm going to come to you. Uh, you talked about a little bit friendship breakups. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. this surprises a lot of people. We think that, I think most people are blindsided sometimes. Uh, like, what happened? Why is this happening? Uh, you mentioned off the top, how are friendship breakups difficult to navigate and how did you sort of navigate that? Yeah, um, I think they're so difficult because we don't really talk about them like we talk about the breakup of a romantic partnership. And so I think a lot of people don't really necessarily have the skills to navigate a friendship breakup. And I think if we normalize them, they will feel a lot less scary and a lot less lonely and isolating. But there's research just to show that our friendship cycles can go in seven year periods. And as we grow and get older and change and our perspective increases or enhances, um, we may just grow apart from people. And so um, they're tough. I think they're tough to navigate because they don't often have like a set ending. Um, like a breakup might be final with your partner. You know, it's like, we're breaking up, we're done, this is over. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times friendships sort of just fizzle out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to navigate a friendship breakup, you really have to be strong on your communication skills and sort of be able to have open, honest conversations with your friends. And I think kind of not be afraid of that ending. But I think friendships can be scarce. And I mean, like, I think a lot of people are lucky if they have one good friend, one or two good friends. So it can be, yeah, it's a really scary experience. Some yeah. have 10. Yeah, some have so uh, uh, Julie, I want to come to you. Uh, we, we talked about sort of the end of, of mm -hmm. some friendships. Let's talk prevention. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done to sort of prevent 
friendship breakups. Some run their course and that's it, but there's some work that needs to be done as well that can keep that going. Yeah, absolutely. So things like um, open conversations about expectations, right, and letting other people know what they can realistically expect from you, I think is a really important conversation to have, especially if you're anticipating changes in a friendship dynamic, right, like a move or someone becoming a parent, right, or a change in job. Um, Letting friends know, right, like how how these changes are impacting you, um, and if that means, right, they can rely on you for different things now, I think that's a really important conversation to have. I think the other piece is just um, in line with communication. I mean, it doesn't take much sometimes to let someone else know that you're thinking of them and that you care about them, right? So don't underestimate the value of um, small social gestures, whether it's a text or an email or a quick phone call, just to say, I'm thinking about you, I care about you, right? That's a way to put some deposits in that friendship bank account, right? So that there are difficulties ahead, right? Then, you know, you've got more than enough in your bank account. All right, Dave, so you wrote about one important factor for heterosexual men to maintain friendships, which is the code of masculinity. Being vulnerable is admitting to another person that you need something from them. Their sympathy, their understanding, their forgiveness, their care, their advice, whatever it might be. And that's particularly difficult for men since it goes against everything instilled in us about the importance of self-sufficiency, stoicism, and never emitting weakness. Do you see this in yourself and the men around you? To certain degrees, of course. Yeah, I think I think you know your point about you know this this certainly applying um, to heterosexual men is true, and that all of us from a very young age are socialized to believe these certain ideas about what it is to be a guy. Right? You should be stoic. You should be self reliant. Do not admit weakness. And I think me and my friends and a lot of men are good at counteracting that or, or, or rejecting it in certain ways. Um, but it still applies to some degree to many, if not most of us, right? I don't, I don't think it's really either or kind of question. It's just sort of how much are you willing to be open? And I think, I think when you begin to do it, it gets a lot easier. And the funny thing that I experienced with my guy friends is that when I began to do it just a little bit, <laughs> And they do it just a little bit too, right? It's not, when we talk about men being vulnerable, it's not some huge show of emotion, right? It doesn't have to be. It could just say, you know, I'm really struggling in my relationship right now. Can you give me some advice? Or I'm having a hard time at work. Those are the kinds of things that can open up these conversations to really unlock the benefits of friendship. So it's not a huge step to take. But it is something a lot of guys can feel uncomfortable about, which is typically why I think when men do that kind of thing, they pick their one best friend alone in a room and they do it. They don't sit down with five or six buddies and say, get ready for this. <laughs> yeah. All right, David, I'm gonna get your take on that as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, vulnerability matters. I think, as, as you said, finding at least that one person. But I, I would push against even the idea that I think men, if, if I can mm-hmm. locate it there, I think. I think we're doing our best. Yeah. And actually, I think we do quite well, given everything. And sometimes the way that we have these conversations, we sort of center around the, the deficiencies of men in our communication skills, our emotional literacy, and all these sorts of things, oftentimes measuring us against our female counterparts. Instead of looking at the ways in which men create space for vulnerability and relationship building, despite not necessarily having the adeptness at uh, uh, speaking about and articulating emotions in the way that many women have, have come to, to do, for example, I recently was uh, with a friend, uh, and similar to your story, you know, he invited me over for a meal. And as he was barbecuing chicken, did we begin to have a conversation about his issues with his girlfriend and the feelings of isolation and issues around career? And, and so there are ways that I think uh, men and, and a lot of people are attempting to adapt to and resist against um, loneliness and create relationships and repair where needed to. And I think men do a really good job of that. I think one thing that we do well is centering around activities. You know, a lot of of, of communication for men is nonverbal and paraverbal. And so it's through the the, the pickup games and the basketball and the barbecues or whatever. I know those are all very stereotypical men things. (laughs) We're actually building those bonds, and as you spoke about, yeah. we're, we're getting in those hours that create um, yeah. that relation, you know, best friends. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I think, 
I think in a weird way, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it made this a lot easier for guys. Mm -hmm. In that prior to the pandemic, to admit to certain weaknesses, let's say, might have been a little bit more <laughs> difficult for men. But in the context of a pandemic, everyone's going through right. some major things. And so to admit that you yourself are going through some things is not as, mm -hmm. as, as, as stark of a difference, right? It's like, yeah, me too, we're in a pandemic. What do you wanna talk about? I'm here to talk about you. And so that has always been kind of one of the interesting things I've found in the last few years is that the guys in my life, maybe it's because of you know more long lasting cultural changes, but I think it's certainly some kind of effect of the pandemic is that they're a lot more open to talking about what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. David, I do wanna to return to something that you did say when you were giving sort of a, a list of examples of, of things that uh, people can do. Potentially, there can be barriers to, to accessing some of that stuff. And I am curious, uh, how do social and economic circumstances affect the way people socialize and interact with each other? Yeah, so I began by talking about the fact that men build relationship in proximity, but through activity. Um, if there are uh, financial and economic barriers in a city, in, in many cities, which is changing, um, gentrifying, um, locking people out of, of communal space, there's an absence, and I think some of what you do in the online space is trying to respond to that, but there's an absence of communal gathering spaces where we would come together, where there's a, a sort of organizing principle or a way of which we could all be together. There's, we're all in one accord. We're all sort of divided up into these little tribal groups right now, and, and that just adds to that feeling of, of, of separation. If one is already experiencing financial hardship or um, you know, not only finances, but even the way in which the city is laid out. There are parts of the city that exist in a bit of a silo and uh, don't have the opportunities to go to a particular basketball court or go to the, the cottage with your friends. It, that it changes. You know, one of the things, especially for young men, I'm finding in the ways in which they try to respond to this is the sort of um, uptake of streaming culture and gaming culture. Now, we know, and you're the psychologist, you could speak to how that might breed some instances of, of mental health and, and other concerns, but for a lot of men, it's, it's where they build relationships. That as they're playing these games mm -hmm. with someone who's maybe not even in the city, they're creating that, that connection. And so um, men of all types, I think, are responding as best they can, but financial and economic uh, disparities can limit that for a lot of men. I'm going to get you to respond to that as well. Yeah, certainly I think when anybody's experiencing feelings of insecurity or scarcity, uh, especially economically, right, I think friendships can get bumped down the priority list quite a bit, right, in terms of our hierarchy of needs. It's probably more important in our minds to take care of sort of our economic security and stability. I think to your point around video games, I mean, I'm a firm believer in taking any social opportunities that you might have and capitalizing on them, right? So video games and online communities provide a space for people to connect with one another even if it's at a distance right. um, that's certainly better than nothing at all right. all right Chloe how do quality friendships contribute to setting healthy relationship standards and boundaries I mean when you have quality friendships you can learn from your friends and see um, I mean, you gain perspective from, from your relationships and your friendships. And I always say, like, I think it's so important, um, and I speak from a women's perspective, um, for us to really diversify our friend groups, meet people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, many different life experiences, because when you have friends that have experienced things that maybe you're going through, you become empowered and um, have, you learn from them, you learn, you gain knowledge, you gain the skills from just based off of seeing your friends kind of navigate the same stuff that you have done. Like for example, I, I made a friend who, I actually made a friend online through work who I saw one day post about um, her breakup online and uh, she quit her job and she broke up with her partner and she sold her house. And I remember looking at that Instagram post like it was a car crash, like I couldn't mm. stop looking at it. And I remember messaging her saying like, one day I can't wait to tell you how you inspired me mm. to do what you did. And I think just having her as a friend, knowing that she was capable of doing something that I was so afraid of doing that I didn't think was ever possible for me, um, it was really empowering. And so I always try to give that message back to other women in my community, um, the more people you know, the stronger your network is, the more just the more empowered you are to kind of learn different ways of going about life, different ways of knowing what's possible um, for yourself. All right, we have a couple minutes left, and I have one question for all of you. I'm going to start with David. I'm always starting with you, putting you on the spot. <laughs> I, I what's, see. What's one piece 
of friendship advice you would give to our viewers? Space for grace, you know. I think we're in a moment right now which is quick to, to cut and to sever. And grace is sort of the invitation to leave room for people, you know. Um, and in leaving room for others, we're, we're also leaving room for, for ourselves. And one of the things you spoke about was, you know, how our relationships help define how we are, even with ourselves. And so by giving the people in our lives that space, we are inviting them to give us that space back. Julie. I would say don't underestimate the power of small social gestures and bids for connection with other people. Um, people can't see your social intentions. They can only see your behavior, right? So we need to keep that in mind um, and always make sure we're keeping the lines of communication open and making it clear to other people we're open to connection. All right, Chloe. I would say um, be open to friendships and connections with people that you may never have considered before because I think they can just teach you so much and you can really support each other in different ways you never thought was possible. All right, and Dave, I come to you also, you are a father, and so with that perspective as well, I am curious, you know, what, what's some advice there for, for all the fathers out there? <laughs> um, I'd say call your friends and tell them you love them. Yeah. and. I mean, if you and if you're looking to make friends, especially for fathers, put the time in to be with the friends that you have. Let them know how important they are to you, and look for opportunities to make new friends. Right? It's great to have a core group of friends, but like you said, new friends expand your world in wonderful ways. And so, when you are out or you meet someone who you're interested in, who you like, who you feel you have some kind of chemistry with even don't be afraid to just say like hey you know do you want to go get a cup of coffee or I'll see you are you here at the game next week I'll see you here like had a great time with you don't be don't be locked into certain ways of behavior that's going to prevent you from making new friends really really great advice Dave Chloe David Julie thank you so much for joining us on the program thank, thank you very much thank you thanks I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.